Where in the world can you hang out with your friends, eating on the streets, and zipping around town in a Ferrari like a rich kid? So I was able to see China from a lot of different vantage points. As a foreigner, I was able to sort of inhabit a pretty diverse set of spaces just by virtue of, of kind of blagging my way into a conversation or talking my way into a friend group. I've been on the side of the road eating shao kao, eating Chinese barbecue for, you know, ten dollars to treat all five of my friends who were there. And I've watched a Maserati go by. And I've watched these young guys' faces, their expressions change, realizing that they're never gonna have that life. They're never gonna uh, attain that sort of wealth. I've also been in that Maserati with a young person, zooming past that shao kao, and then watching that person see those young guys on the side of the street thinking, God, am I lonely? Do I wish I had some semblance of a, of a group of friends, something that I could belong to? And, and that this car, the, these riches, aren't giving me the sort of fulfillment that was promised. That is Zach Deitwalt, 28 years old from Berkeley, California. After living in China for four years, he's become a fluent Mandarin speaker, author, and CEO of a think tank, the Young China Group. If you miss his personal story in part one of our interview, I urge you to check it out. He told us why he went to China and how he was living a Chinese life. Now in part two, he describes the dream, drive, and desire of his generation in China. Title of his book, Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World. I'm Evil Chan, and this is One in a Billion, a show about China, one person at a time. How would you describe your generation, the 20-something in China? Four words. Aspirational, pressured, restless, proud. But how are those characteristics unique to young Chinese? I think they are amplified in China in a way that we don't see anywhere else in the world, truly. I think they are uniquely Chinese, in part because of the enormous scale of these cohorts that we're talking about. There really is nothing to compare uh, globally, even in, in massive millennial populations like India, to what this young generation in China feels like. To understand why Zach sounds so upbeat about this generation, you have to go back and listen to part one of our interview with him. He talked about going to China when he was 20, the first time as a study abroad student. Then at 22, he decided to stay because he was hooked. His lifestyle, very local. I was always living with roommates who are always Chinese. And also we were all kind of trying to get by, which is sort of the state of things in China. I think living that lifestyle allowed me to understand far more. It allowed me to slip into the minds of the people who were describing the pressures of work, the pressures of having enough for groceries, wanting to eat out, wanting to treat people, wanting to live sort of the life that was becoming more and more available in China. That lifestyle is mostly about consumption. Nice restaurant, cool bar, not to mention smartphones, video games, or karaoke lounges, where young people are famous for singing their heart out and revealing their true selves. But wait, how much does that kind of lifestyle cost? How much do young Chinese make? I was living full-time in China for four years. I was making a very meager amount, I would say about $1,200 a month for the majority of it. Uh, when I actually, by the way, in China, in Chengdu, that's above the average income there. The average monthly income there, around $900. But a recent study in Beijing says new college graduates earned about $588 a month, less than the cost of an iPhone. By comparison, college graduates in the U.S. make about $3,900 a month. But in China, the 400 million people in their 20s and 30s are feeding a consumer loan frenzy. They borrow to buy cars, pay for mortgages, luxury brands, last but not least, for travel. Travel? Here are the numbers. Young Chinese between 18 and 34 years old spend more than 150 billion billion dollars and made 82 million trips abroad in 2016 versus Americans of all ages who took 75 million trips overseas. That's according to Bloomberg Intelligence. How do they pay for that lifestyle? Credit card. They are now part of a growing generation that borrows without blinking. 
pushing China's household debt to 40 percent of its GDP, according to Chinese investment bank, the CICC. The danger? Defaults. That could put pressure on lenders' solvency, triggering a financial crisis affecting not only China, but the world. As China becomes a more innovative economy, the young people want to be paid more. Right now, China graduates about 8 million college students every year, and the job market has not kept pace. Yet family pressure to buy in apartments and to get married keeps mounting. You're expected to get married in your 20s, at the latest in your 30s. This recognition that young men all over the country felt this traditional purpose, this pr- traditional drive that was you know, foisted on them by their parents to marry, that that was a, a large purpose in their lives. Where do you see that drive play out? In the property market. Today, you're not seen as an eligible bachelor in China unless you own property, unless you own an apartment. This is the modern manifestation of what people call anchuengan, this feeling of this, this sense of safety, this sense of security. So young men feel enormously driven because they want to form a family, which is a traditional idea, to buy property. That is one of their biggest obsessions. Now, if you've seen the property markets in China... Yes, I have. Here it is. Average home prices in China's top cities is about $1,875 per square meter, according to a recent Shanghai survey. And one square meter is 10 square feet. No one on the average wage in China can buy an apartment in the city that they're living. The average income is $900 a month. And so an average city apartment, which is about 710 square feet, costs more than 12 years of an average income. So again, this actually moves back to the idea of pressure, which is that there's this idea of a life I should live. But the reality is I don't make enough to to have that life. They're intensely aspirational, but there's just currently not enough high paying jobs for well-educated young people, as this young generation increasingly is. So a lot of people feel let down by that. They have this Chinese dream that they were told if they work hard, they study hard, they can attain a certain level of security and, and financial stability. But that hasn't always panned out. So how do they cope? So they have to eat their parents, financially speaking, in order to afford an apartment. So in order to get married, in order to form that family that is seen as so important to make their parents happy, to make their grandparents happy, pretty much every apartment in China is going to be bought not just by one person, but by an entire four to one family structure behind them. So the joke is in China, you have an entire housing market propped up by an even larger marriage market. In his book, Zach delves into this intergenerational support system he calls four to one. One is the only child. He or she is supported by and expected to later support both parents and the grandparents. This cultural expectation for young people to hit these milestones in life is unrelenting, especially for women. Young women are also told to commit the first 15 years of their life to the gaokao, to nose to the grindstone, study every single day to get into an excellent college. And after you get into an excellent college, you have to get the best job that you have to get into. And then you're 25 and and hurry up and learn how to date and to spew out some kids. It sounds insane, doesn't it? Yet young men and women all over China are learning to redefine what it means to be a good Chinese and what it means to live a good life individually. In your book, you have this huge headline, How the Restless Generation Will Change the Country. And what you're just alluding to is exactly that. They pick and choose what it means for them to miss a certain milestone. You know, not get married before 27 or have kids uh, and a family before 30. So I want you to maybe give me some specific examples. You mentioned single women being seen as leftover. If they, for example, decide not to subscribe to these milestones that we've just talked about, how are they changing China? Will they become a source of threat to the family culture? How will these young people change their country and the future? The most radical idea is this idea of Easternization. There is a sort of tacit understanding or expectation that as a country modernizes, it also westernizes. But what you're seeing with this young generation in China is a generation with a strong sense of self. What is a common thread 
in their individual dream? Is it this idea that they're left alone to pursue their own sense of self? No, I don't think that's it. That's part of it. And that's, again, I, I see that as more these young people wanting to make room for that sense of self rather than it dominating their trajectory as they grow up, which is something their, their parents did not feel like they had. And then have the, the basic dignity afforded to them of a country and a people on the rise, which is respect for who they are, respect for their, how they see the world. China's leap to become an economic superpower happened within the past 20-some years within these young people's lifetime. They feel proud, even as they feel pressured. I was born in 1990, so my friends who were born in 1990 in China, we, we sort of, we, we've been alive the same amount of time. The U.S.'s per capita GDP has increased two and a half times since I was born. For my friends in China, born in the exact same year, their per capita GDP has increased 27 times in their lifetime. 27 times. In the last chapters of Zach's book, he asked 100 Chinese if they have a belief system. The majority answered, money. That is the same as in my own experience. One Chinese millennial told me, we want to make money. At least we know what we want. That's a simple, straightforward goal that they have learned from their parents and grandparents. How about their biggest fear? One character, Tom, in the last chapter of Zach's book, says his greatest fear is having to make his kids ride the subway. He's afraid he's going to be so average that he cannot provide or create something for himself and actualize his potential, and that his future just fades into the middle, into mediocrity, in a country with 1.4 billion people. In our next episode, I am struggling personally through my parents always babysitting me throughout my whole life. They sacrificed a lot from being a first-generation immigrant, myself included. I was born in Hebei, China. So with that, there's a lot of burden, baggage, responsibility in carrying all of their sacrifices and manifesting in this investment. Like I am I, what you call the final product and they want to make me their dream that they have never really fulfilled. That's next month in This Chinese Life Whose life is it anyway? One in a billion is... Brian Latwinowicz. Sarah Zhu. Yvette Yu. And our lovely theme song is composed by Brad McCarthy. Let us know if you want to join our team of volunteers, help us plan events, pitch a story. Just go to our new website, oneinabillionvoices.org, and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Support for our podcast comes from our collaboration with the Victor and William Fung Foundation. 